he is the lord who gives and the lord who chooses to take he is sovereign and he is the one who who is gracious and blesses us with his good choices Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your glorious name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your glorious name Blessed be your name land that is plentiful His streams of abundance flow Blessed be your name Blessed be your name and I found in the desert place to walk through the wilderness Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to pray When the darkness closes in Lord Still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your glorious name Blessed be your name the sun shining down on me the world's all as it should be this be on this said be your name Lord marked with suffering this pain in the offering this be on Every blessing you pour out I'll turn back to pray When the darkness closes in Lord still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your glorious name Give and take away Give and take away My heart will choose to say Blessed be your name Give and take away Give and take away what will choose to say oh, blessed be your name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your glorious name blessed be the name of the lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your glorious name Every blessing that the Lord pours out we turn back to praise Every day we see his glorious grace in action every day we see his new mercies and the lord is the author of that he gives us new mercies to face the challenges and obstacles of every day so that is why you know we we have to come back to him and give him praise because the lord equips us and he makes us strong enough to face the day so this song says he's the reason that i live 
He is my constant vision. The water I drink, the treasure that I seek more than gold. Be the reason I live. Be my quest, my constant vision. Be the water I drink, treasure I seek more than gold. Be the fire in my heart. My consuming love and passion Be the air that I breathe Song that I sing From my heart and soul Jesus, Lord of all Be the Lord over me Altar, I come. Here is my heart. May your will be done in me. Be the reason I live. Be my quest, my constant vision. Be the water I drink, treasure I seek, more than gold. Be the fire in my heart My consuming love and passion Be the air that I breathe Song that I sing From my heart and soul Jesus, Lord over all Be the Lord over me Here is my heart, may your will be done in me. Jesus, Lord over all, be the Lord over me. Jesus, drawn to the Altar I come, here is my heart, may your will be done in me. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you because your mercies are new every morning. And because Jesus has saved us, he's the reason why we live. He is the reason why we celebrate life. Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we pray that the Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts would be the fire inside us. He would be the consuming love and passion of our lives. He would be the air that we breathe. And he would be the song that we sing from our hearts. We thank you, O Master, that the Lord is in control of our lives. He knows our present, He knows our future, He knows our past. And we need not be afraid of things which we cannot control or we can control either. We can rest assured that God will take care of our past, present and future. There is nothing that is beyond your capability, O Lord Father. You are the Almighty, all-knowing, ever-present God. And we come to you this evening with a grateful heart. God has done this marvelous thing in our lives. And we come to your word, O oh Lord, that the word speaks to us. It cleanses us. It gives us purpose and direction. It gives us the truth. And we come to you week after week to understand the truth who is Jesus himself. We surrender ourselves. We worship at your feet. May God's will be done in our lives this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So thank you for joining in this Sunday evening. Okay, so it's one week more for the VBS. I hope you guys have registered. Uh, it's called Ocean Commotion and we're doing it from uh, 15th to 19th of this month. Okay, 
So keep it in our prayers and you know, may God speak to us throughout the VBS time and pass it on to all our friends and you know, invite them also to join in. I think the registrations are closed, I'm not sure. But then check it up with the WhatsApp groups that you're in. So we're planning ocean commotion from 15th to 19th. Keep uh, the teachers in prayer, keep the organizers in prayer as we go for another year of United VBS. Okay. All right, so let's go back to the study of Acts. On Sundays, we check out Acts, and we are in chapter 8. We saw the arrest of Stephen, one of the people who were chosen to take care of the, of the food needs of the Greek converts. And we saw that Stephen was arrested, and he gave a defense of himself, and then we saw his martyrdom as people... Uh, you know, approached him and threw stones at him and killed him. So we saw that um, uh, this was in God's will and uh, uh, this person did give a testimony of Jesus and he also behaved like Jesus when uh, he uh, asked the Lord to forgive them that were stoning him. Okay, So that much we saw last time and today we are going to check from chapter Eight onwards. Okay, Acts chapter eight. All right. So I'm going to read from verses uh, one to eight. Okay, chapter eight, verses one to eight. Now, Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging of men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed and there was great joy in that city. There was great joy in that city. Alright, so let's first focus on the first three verses. It talks about two incidents. One is about uh, the persecution that started and then it's about the preaching of the word. So, before both these things start, there is a mention of a man called Saul. Okay, he is going to be the focus of the three-fourth of the uh, book of Acts. Okay, later on, we will find that he is going to be the main focus of the book after some time. And how God moved through him and touched the Gentiles. Right. So, uh, that, that is a focus of the book of Acts. But before we go into that, let us also look at um, um, the sketch that the Bible gives about this man's life. He is portrayed as a zealous person, okay? a man with great zeal. What do you understand from the word zeal? Zeal is like, you know, if you have this uh, Pepsi bottle or something like that and you shake it up and then you open the cap and that froth that comes out, okay? that effervescence, we call it the effervescence, that is the word that is connected with zeal, okay? bubbling passion. Okay? That's what zeal actually means. So, if Saul was a zealous man, you know, the passion with which he did whatever he thought was correct, that was bubbling, you know, that was effervescent, bubbling zeal. And that's that zeal, whether he was against Christ or whether he was working for Christ, this zeal sort of consumed him. You know? So he was a great man with great zeal, okay? whether he was against Christ or even when he was supporting Christ also. So, what does the Bible tell about Saul? We understand a few facts about Saul. What is that? He was born in Tarsus in Cilicia. Okay, there's a place called Cilicia in the Bible. There's a Bible map at the back of your Bibles. Usually Bibles have a map at the back. Uh, some, some people have a color map. Some people have a black and white map. If you can check the back of your Bibles, you will find a map which gives you this location called Tarsus or Cilicia. Both of these could be there. Acts chapter 22 gives you the details about that. 
when Paul introduces himself, he says that he is from Tarsus in uh, Cilicia. Okay, you can find that in Acts chapter 22 and verse 3. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you all are today. Okay. So, uh, he was zealous towards God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Okay. So, you can see his zeal in all these things. He ran from person to person getting official letters so that he could arrest and put into prison everyone who deviated from the Judaistic religion. Anyone who went away from the traditional faith that he believed in. The faith of their ancestors, they call it. You know? So, this faith, if anybody left this and went towards Christianity or following Christ, then Saul would be your enemy. Saul would be the person that you have to beware of. He is the most dangerous man on the opposite team. Okay, so that's the that's the introduction that Paul gives about himself. He was like he was breathing fire. The Bible says, see. So he was brought up as a Jew. Okay, so he was originally he was really a Jew only. Okay, but then uh, you get more in more um, details about Paul in the rest of the uh, Bible account, like Second Corinthians. There is another passage in 2 Corinthians where he gives an introduction. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And verse 22 onwards. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 22 onwards. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I uh, um I speak as a fool, I am more. See, I speak as a fool, I am more. Then again, in, in the book of Philippians, <coughs> the book of Philippians, right, chapter 3 and verse 5. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5. Circumcised the earth day, eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, Concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That's how Paul was himself. When he was Saul, okay, he was like that. When he was before he was conversion, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, which means he you know he was a Pharisee true to that core. Okay? He was the, the real Pharisee, or he was the downright Hebrew. If, if there was an example for a, a zealous Hebrew, you can point at Paul and say, he's the man. He's the man. He was the son of a Pharisee and he was raised up as a Pharisee, you know, teaching the law. Gamaliel taught him the law. Gamaliel was a respected rabbi in Israel and he taught him the law. And then, um, you know, in Acts itself, it says that he was a Roman citizen. He was a Roman citizen. He was well educated in Tarsus and then for his higher education, for his religious education, he was sent to Jerusalem and he was trained under the strict rabbi called Gamaliel. See, so he was a, so after his training, he became a devoted Pharisee. See, so when you measure his life by the law, according to the law and the commandments of the Bible and the Old Testament, you would find that this man is blameless he's blameless see so if if you ask gamaliel you know tell me the, the names of five of your promising students you know and he would say paul would be there in the top 5 or he would be the top one you know because he was excellent as a pharisee he was excellent as a, a man who followed the law so definitely he was one of the top students of uh, gamaliel institute of pharisaical studies so he was going to be a great leader for the Jewish faith. 
he was going to be an excellent uh, what do you say pharisee who would be you know uh, who would be a religious uh, uh, what do you call it extremist that is how saul was so the way that he exhibited his passion for the judaistic faith is by persecuting the church he really thought that you know if he is killing the jews or uh, killing the christians if he is persecuting the believers he was actually serving god he was doing what god wanted him to do see so according to him he had received some light okay and he was faithful to that light that god had given him see he thought he was obeying that light that little light that he got from god see so then on the way to damascus god gave him the real light god gave him the truth he was hit with jesus the real light and then he became faithful to that light that shone into his life see so bible says that he made havoc of the church you know the word that is used here you know uh, it says at that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at jerusalem and they were all scattered um verse 3 says as for saul he made havoc of the church the word havoc actually means like imagine uh, that you are in a uh, in a jungle and a wild animal comes and attacks you the way that the wild animal like an, a lion or a or a cheetah or something you know comes and attacks you and mangles you okay makes you full of you know wounds and scars that is what havoc the word means okay like a wild animal attacking so paul was ripping to shreds the church okay he thought this is this is how i serve the lord this is how i am serving the lord this is how i am glorifying god's name see so he ripped the church to shred he would rip the believers to shreds so when uh, jesus meets him you know in uh, uh, acts chapter 9 uh, uh, where is that jesus speaking to paul he says Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting against. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Okay, so what does he mean there? Now, goads are these um, sharp-pointed uh, steel rods. Okay, it's like arrows at the end. It's very sharp at the end. What uh, farmers actually use these goads? These goads, you know, if uh, the oxen does not move when the farmer is plowing the field. if the ox is not moving forward he takes these sharp steel rods and he pokes at the legs of the ox to make them to force them to move but when that ox feels the pain from these rods this ox will kick back he'll kick back against the rod so what will happen is the the ox thinks that he is getting revenge or he's kicking back but what happens is the rod is still there you know and the flesh on the leg cuts into the into the rod even more into the sharp end of the rod even more and it hurts the beast even more so jesus asking why are you kicking against the goads okay why are you kicking against the rods you're going to hurt yourself if you fight against jesus you're going to hurt yourself there jesus calls him a beast you know you're like a beast kicking against the goads you're hurting yourself so when when the bible says that he was attacking the church like an animal jesus also calls him an animal he was behaving like a beast and during the stoning of stephen we see that he was consenting to his death saul approved of it okay so he will go to any lengths to achieve his purpose that is the kind of person saul is he persecuted both men and women unto death see that's the that's the, that's the purpose that's the purpose of his life he says i i will finish these people this heretic group that has come up this uh, cult that has been formed i will destroy them i will root them out of the earth see so he was destroying them so they he had them imprisoned he had them beaten and he forced them to renounce their faith in jesus christ compelling them to even blaspheme jesus see acts chapter 26 and verse 11 acts chapter 26 and verse 11 
So says, and I punish them often in every synagogue, compel them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. See, I compel them to blaspheme. So now he, he remembers all these things, what he did. You know, he was so enraged towards the Christians. See? So if they don't recant their faith in Christ, they would be immediately killed. That's the kind of persecutor Saul was. Right? So he was exceedingly mad against them. He was a blasphemer. You know, he was he, he didn't know that Jesus Christ was the true Lord. So he forced the Christians to blaspheme Jesus. Indirectly, he was a blasphemer. See. So the, he was also a man of great authority. You know, nobody could enter into the high priest chamber like that and get permissions like that. See. So he was a man who had great contacts. I'm sure Gamaliel being on the on the committee, you know, on the Sanhedrin also was favorable for Saul. He would have been the next in command. See, if there is a Pharisee who is going to be elected in the next, among the younger group, Saul would be the next candidate. See, so he is a man of authority also. He is a man of connections, contacts. See, so because this kind of zeal, this wrong, misplaced zeal consumed him, his life was almost destroyed. See, he was so devoted to the law that the law almost consumed him. No. And God, what did he do? He showed mercy and he saved him. See. So, he is the last person in Israel or the last person in Jerusalem whom you would think would be converted. Okay. He is a notorious criminal and that is the man whom God chose. Okay. God showed him mercy and God saved him. So he's the last person anybody would think of being part of the, to be part of the church. But God had a plan for this man. And second, we, are, we see people who went down to Samaria. And there was this man called Philip. Now Philip is a direct contrast with Saul. Okay, Why? Because Saul was persecuting the church and Philip was building the church. You know? He was working for the church. So a faithful preacher, he is a, you know, uh, a horrible persecutor, that is Saul, and now we see a faithful preacher. See, what, uh, when, when you look at the church, persecution is to the church what wind is to seeds. You know, when you, when you think about pollination and you know, when the seeds have to be scattered to different places, nature uses wind. Wind scatters uh, you know, the seeds, right, you know, far and wide, so that the plants would uh, germinate in other places, right. So, same way like how wind carries the seed, persecution carries the gospel to remote places. And what happens is, you know, a great harvest comes out of this. So, the word scattered, if you check in this, in this passage itself, you see the word scattered. The word scattered actually comes from this Greek word diaspora. Diaspora. What does it mean? Diaspora means to scatter seed. To scatter seeds. So the believers in Jerusalem were God's seed. And the persecution was used by God to plant them in different places, in different soils, in new soil. So that their seed could bear more fruit. When Jesus used that parable of the sower, you know, he says this about the sower going and scattering the seeds, uh, you know, uh, sowing the seeds. Right? So, some people, they went through Judea and Samaria. Actually, Jesus had prophesied that, you know, he had told them that this would happen. He said uh, in uh, chapter 1 and verse 8, but you shall receive power, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come uh, upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the second phase of the gospel spreading had begun. But how did it start? It started with persecution. See, So Christian need not be afraid of persecution. He should be prepared for persecution. But the moment we are persecuted and we are scattered, the gospel advances. It spreads 
a greater harvest is coming so now just as jesus had predicted as jesus had prophesied now the gospel was being taken outside of jerusalem to judea and samaria and other others went even further that is what the third stage of the uh, spread of the gospel would be you know so it went far and wide because of the persecution now who were these samaritans we saw that the samaritans were half breed people a mixture of jews and gentiles okay now uh, those of you who don't know the history of it i will explain this it happened long time ago during the uh, 700 bc 730 bc okay there was a time when israel was disobedient to god and god had promised them that he would send people to punish them and the army that god used to punish them were the assyrians a nation called assyria now they advanced towards israel and they occupied the northern territories okay the 10 uh, tribes were situated in the northern part of israel they captured those areas and what did they do they had this uh, you know method where they would not allow any revolution to come up so what they do is they deport the younger people mainly the men and the younger folk okay what they do is they take all the young men and they transport them to another country another place right so they, they, they just deported the people and then what they do is from that country they will import the young men from that country into israel to the same places where they took these men from see they will bring those people and allow them to stay in this country so there is an exchange of young people able people men so what is left people who are sick people who are maimed people who are uh, old and people who are you know, mainly women they are the people who are left behind so this new group of people are brought in and the people from that native place are deported to a foreign place why do they do that because these men will lose their identity and they will they will be forced to stay in an environment which they will not be able to raise any revolt against the assyrians they will not be able to rebel against the authorities so this is the kind of insecurity that they put into the hearts of these young men so because of that these foreigners when they came to israel they started living uh, you know uh, making that their native place so they started marrying the women and they started living in that place as their own so after many many years when the israelites came back after their exile when these israelites came back they saw that there was a different group of people here they are half breeds originally assyrians when they brought them they were gentiles now they married with the jewish women and they are half jews see they have children now and those children are not pure breed jews they are actually half gentiles so because of that they were called the samaritans okay they lived in this area mainly called the samaria so they were called the samaritans so these people also worship the same god of the jews these people also worshiped at the temple but when the jews came back they refused to allow these men entry into the temple so this men they were forced to build their own temple in samaria that's where that when jesus is talking to that woman at the well in john chapter 4 you'll find that she asked this question to jesus where should we worship should we worship in jerusalem or is it okay to worship on top of this mountain on our new temple and jesus says neither in jerusalem nor on that mountain god is a spirit you don't need a temple to worship god doesn't dwell in temples made by human hands in fact he dwells in our hearts he dwells in our hearts so now the samaritans were a group of people who also worshiped yahweh but the jews would not accept them as their people so there was a difference between the jew and the samaritan the jew could not tolerate the samaritans so samaritans would have an enmity towards the jews okay so the samaritans had their own temple and they had their own priests and they would not mingle with the jews and the jews also would not mingle with the samaritan they would not allow them to enter into their temple in jerusalem also so did god allow this yes god did allow this persecution why because these people would refuse to leave jerusalem you know they were, they were, if they are comfortable in jerusalem they we, we wouldn't want to leave our place our homes our, some of them had to leave their families we would not leave them by ourselves right but god wanted the gospel to go forward 
from Jerusalem to the Judea and Samaria. So he made sure that this this would uh, you know scatter them. This would scatter them, and the gospel would advance. So we should admire these people for the courage that they showed, because they they are willing to go, and they went, and wherever they went, they preached the gospel. So what about this man? This man, you know, uh, Philip. He went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip. See, so this is actually something amazing that happened there. And uh, Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. See. So, because of the witness of Stephen, the scattering happened. But now, the scattering has caused the blessing of these people in Samaria. See, so wherever these people went, there they preached. Now, who is this Philip? Now, if you look at that, uh, you know, list of people who were chosen to serve in chapter six, you will find uh, chapter six and verse five, and saying. And the saying pleased the whole uh, multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon. They are the men whom who were chosen to serve at the tables. That is the person this Philip is. See, so this Philip, not the Apostle Philip, he was the evangelist Philip, or the elder Philip, you know, who was supposed to help in the serving of the food. This is the Philip who went down. To Samaria, the apostles never left. You know, it said in the next verse, right? Everyone except for the apostles were scattered. So this can't be the apostle Philip. This is the evangelist Philip who was actually chosen along with Stephen. So he was chosen as a deacon, just like Stephen. He grew in the ministry and became an effective evangelist. He became an effective evangelist. Check. Chapter twenty-one and verse eight, Acts chapter twenty-one and verse eight. What does the Bible finally say about Apostle Phil, uh, Evangelist Philip? Uh, Acts chapter twenty-one and verse eight. On the next day, this is Paul arriving. We who were Paul's companions, that is Luke and Silas and all the team, okay, departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with them. That is his identity. He was one among the seven. Who had chosen to, uh, you know, serve at the tables, and this one who was chosen from the seven, he be, he was known as Philip the Evangelist, and where was he sitting? Where was he living? He was living near Caesarea, and once these people entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with them. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. See, so he he had four daughters who were also. Continuing in the ministry, God directed this man to evangelize in Samaria, an area that was previously not allowed. You know not, where the disciples or apostles never went, so he was able to go to that place and start the work there. Now, if you look at John's Gospel, chapter three, you will find that Jesus went to Samaria and he ministered there. Then earlier than Jesus, even John the Baptist ministered there. John chapter three and John chapter four, you will see that. So, uh, John had gone there and planted the seed. Jesus had gone there and planted the seed. Now Stephen was going there and harvesting. Okay, he was collecting the harvest. See, so Philip was entering into those areas where Jesus and John the Baptist had already laboured. See, that's what the Bible says. You know, sometimes the Lord wants us to plant seeds. Sometimes God uses somebody else to water the seeds, and lastly, God uses somebody else to harvest the seed. See, so the one who harvests the seed may not be the one who plants the seed. So there are different times when you know God uses different people in the lives of different people, and you know I may be here just to plant seeds in your hearts, and uh, somebody else might water it, and then somebody else might do the harvesting also. So Philip was chosen by God to do this work. Now, what did he do? He preached Christ to them. See, the word preaching 
which means to preach the gospel to evangelize evangelize okay uh, what the, what does preaching christ mean he is means he's uh, like a messenger you know going before god heralding christ he's announcing you know as a as a messenger saying jesus is the christ and he's coming behind me you know that kind of a thing so just like how john the baptist was jesus's herald physically philip was god's commissioned herald to give this message of the gospel to these samaritans those people who were rejected by the jews see so if philip's message was rejected what would happen it is like rejecting god you are rejecting god's messenger and you are rejecting god's message and that is serious business that is serious business so uh, god would hold you accountable if you reject his message and that's why it's a dangerous business when you reject the message of god now philip not only preached the gospel what did he do he continued to minister there and he started performing miracles now how can he do that there is not philip performing the miracles is god's power displayed through philip see mainly we see the apostles doing miracles right acts chapter 2 acts chapter 5 we see that the apostles were mainly doing the wonders and signs but both stephen and philip also did signs and wonders by the power of god check uh, chapter 6 and verse 8 we see that stephen did wonders um, and stephen full of faith and power did great wonders and signs among the people see so god allowed these men who were not the original apostles to also do signs and wonders in his name so signs and wonders were not you know only uh, the the uh, the monopoly of the apostles no the holy spirit was the same in them and in philip and stephen also so god did the same wonders through his men philip as well as stephen also maybe the others also did that no but the bible clearly mentions that this man also did signs and wonders by the power of god but what is the emphasis over here the emphasis over here is the word of god see and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed and there was great joy in that city the great joy in the city did not come only with the healing the healing was to demonstrate that philip is a man of god so his message has to be taken seriously his message has to be taken seriously and if people rejected his message they would receive the healing of course but they would not be saved they would not be saved see so nobody was saved because of the miracles but when they believed the preaching when they pre- believed the gospel of jesus christ then they were saved when they listened to the word after seeing the miracles the word saved them the word saved them the word convicted them the word moved them to repentance and the word saved them nobody was saved through miracles even today nobody is saved through miracles Sa- miracles will only help you to be attracted to the word of god and unless the word of god is preached people are not saved so great persecution plus great preaching of the gospel resulted in great joy great persecution with great preaching of the gospel resulted in great joy right now wherever you see this salvation coming uh, in the gospel of luke if you check if the in acts you check wherever there is salvation it is followed by great joy it is followed by great joy you know why because see joy is not dependent on your circumstances they were being persecuted but yet there was great joy you see joy of salvation so the people of samaria who heard the gospel and believed they were delivered from their physical problems from their demonic control and most importantly they were delivered from their sins no wonder there was great joy right they were delivered from their physical ad- affliction they were delivered from demonic oppression demonic control and now they were also free from their bondage of sin and that is why there was great joy so wherever the salvation message the gospel of jesus christ is presented and people understand that and they believe that there is great change and there is great joy see so the gospel has now moved from jewish territory 
into the Sumerian territory. These people were part Jews, part Gentiles. God in his mercy was building a bridge across these people groups. People who were enemies, people who could not stand seeing each other you know, face to face. They were the ones who were being touched. And soon he was going to extend the same grace to whom? To Gentiles. See, not the mixed Jews of Gentiles, but pure Gentiles. They are going to come into the church. So even today, you know, there are people who build bridges like Philip. They go from their community to another community that has never heard the gospel. And they start preaching there. There are people who move from people group to people group and preach the gospel. You know? I met this man, you know, in Bangalore. He was a man um, who did not have formal education. I think he studied only till second, fourth standard. He, he passed fourth standard, but he could not continue his education after fourth standard. He ended up being an auto driver. You know, they call him Auto Shankar. Okay, Auto Shankar. And uh, what? Uh, uh, yeah, Auto Shankar. And uh, Auto Shankar, what he does is, you know, he used to drive autos, and then he started seeing people who were thrown out of their homes, old people, people who were, uh, you know, having mental problems. They were abandoned by their family members, and the love of Christ so moved in in this boy's heart that he started taking care of these. Old people. You know. He had a broken down house and he brought them all home, gave them bath, gave them new clothes and looked after them. And he and his family and with these destitute people, they were living in that house. He was feeding everyone with his job as an auto driver. And you know, whenever policemen used to find destitutes on the road, they would call this man's number and say, Shankar, can you come and take this man up? And Shankar would do that. And as he kept on doing this, God saw his work and God gave him a wife who would also help him in this ministry. And slowly by steadily, he was leading people who were, you know, who were uh, uh, homeless to Christ. And he started doing a great ministry there. And many people saw the work that he's doing and gave him a piece of land and helped him to build a house, a shelter for all these people. And now today he's doing ministry among those people. He stopped uh, you know, this auto driving thing, but he's doing great work among the destitutes in Bangalore, you know. So when you look at these people, you know, God is building bridges. Who would take care of those people? Who would save them? Who would lead them to Christ? God is using his bridge builders, just like Philip. They will go from one community to another community, one people group to another people group and bring people from there into the kingdom of God. So slowly and steadily, you know, God is going to use you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all mankind and then bring them into the kingdom of God. That is a purpose. So you can be a persecutor of God. Still, God would reach out to you in mercy and grace and he would save you. And an enemy of God turning to Christ and becoming a Christ follower is the greatest testimony that you can find. Even today, this same miracle happens. right? Secondly, being a bridge builder for Christ, just like Philip, going into areas that we have not gone before, going into places where, you know, uh, people have not gone and preached the gospel yet. That could be the mission that God would entrust to you and me. And God would attest his servant with his signs and wonders. You just have to be available and go wherever he calls you to. And you will see great miracles. So the greatest miracle on earth is when a person who is dead in his sins comes alive in Christ, comes to Christ and becomes alive. So this is what God is wanting to do through us. The greatest miracle of all is bringing a person from death, dead in his sins, to life in Christ. May God use you and me powerfully in this generation to lead thousands and thousands of people into the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you call us to be zealous, but for the right reasons, not like Saul, who persecuted the church, who was hurting himself by coming against Jesus. Help us, O oh Lord, to be zealous for the true and living God, to go where he has commanded us, to do the things that he has commanded us to do, to obey his will, to know his word and to do his will. Help us to be zealous for the right reasons. Like Philip, help us to build bridges across people and people, groups who have never heard the gospel before. Help us, O oh Lord, to reach out to them with kindness and love 
and to share the gospel that would save them and bring them closer to the kingdom of God. Sometimes our job may be just to sow the seed of the gospel. Sometimes our job may be just to water the gospel. Sometimes our job may be to harvest the fruit of the gospel. Whatever be our role, help us to do it with all diligence and fervor, passion from our hearts, in obedience to our Savior and Lord. We commit ourselves into your hands. May God's will be accomplished through each one of us in this generation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.